I'd like to ask my Shabbos guests. The question I'd like to ask my Shabbos guests is, if you had, would have a superpower, what superpower would it be? I've heard all kinds of interesting answers throughout the years, coming from all different kinds of places, but the best answer by far was the following. The best answer was, if I had a superpower, I would like to feed people. Someone, a very selfless person, said that their superpower, their wishes, if they would have any superpower, was would be to help people not be hungry. And I wanted to tell you an amazing piece of news that this woman is actually using her superpower, Mar Hashem, and tonight, every night, this has gone out to town to uh, to uh, get people who are unable to leave their house. She made a big vat of soup and literally given chicken soup for the neshama to so many people who can't get out of their house and uh, stuck and would love to have some TLC plus some Jewish penicillin. And it's just an amazing thing. And it made me think a lot about the situation that we're in right now and how the right way to react to it and the right way to connect to where we're supposed to what exactly is happening. Today is a day of an amazing good news. Today is a day when thousands of years ago, we were in Egypt. We were in Egypt for hundreds of years, working really hard. And today is a day when Moses came to us and said to us, attention, came our choppers. I have great news for you. You're going to leave Egypt. The time for the redemption has come. There's going to be miracles and wonders and no Jew will remain in Egypt Everyone is going to be free. Everyone's going to leave Egypt. So today is anniversary of that day. And every year on this day, that announcement of Moses happens again. By remembering that announcement, the Rizal says, we call it forth. We cause it to happen again. And not just to happen again like it happened the first time, but every year, Ma'al Makodesh, there's an additional force of Moshe Rabbeinu, a Moses announcement then, that is present and has an effect today and is relevant today. What's Moses' announcement? Today, by today, you mean Rosh Chodesh or do you mean... Uh... Rosh Chodesh Nisan, Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Rosh Chodesh Nisan. That Moses announces today is a day of redemption, the day when all the Jewish people will be redeemed from this present exile. We're all heading for the redemption. That's the time that we're in now. So it's a time of tremendously good news. There was a Jew who was visiting, I think it was Eb Marash. I've shared this story before, but it's an important one to remember. It bears repeating. Eb Marash asked him, how are things going in your hometown, in Odessa? So he says, in Odessa, we learn together, we daven together, we take care of each other. It's amazing. Odessa is amazing. The Eb Marash is very happy to hear this, and he gives him two silver rubles. Thank you so much for the great news from Odessa. When the man leaves the Rebbe's room, a friend of his asks him, what did the Rebbe say? He says, the Rebbe wanted to know how we're doing in Odessa. So what did you tell him? I told him the truth, that we're learning together, we're davening together. Oh my gosh, you lied to the Rebbe. He, let me tell the Rebbe what really happened, what's really going on in Odessa. He goes into the Rebbe's room, and he tells the Rebbe, how Yanko was fighting with Shmerel and Shmerel was hanging around with Beryl's wife and all kinds of terrible things going on in Odessa. So the Rebbe Menash thanked him, but he didn't give him a silver ruble and the bracha was a little bit lukewarm. So he says, Rebbe, that man didn't tell you the truth and you gave him such an incredible bracha. I told you the truth. And why is my bracha not so great? And the Rebbe Menash said, what's happening in Odessa, I know. I am asking you, where are you in Odessa? So all of us are now at home and we're all in our own environment. And we're all given the opportunity to look in the mirror and to ask ourselves, where are we? What are we doing? Rabbi Lau was in an audience with the Rebbe during the Yom Kippur War. And he said to the Rebbe something to the effect of what will be. And the Rebbe responded, that a Jew does not ask what will be, a Jew asks, what can I do? And just like these women and more than one working together with their husbands to 
they have to ask them a question, what can I do? There are people that are hungry and I want to make sure that they have some attention, some food and some chicken soup for the neshama. That's how they're addressing that question. That's, that, that's how they are responding to the situation. I think it's a very, very um, connected to tonight. Tonight's the anniversary of the passing of the Rebbe Rashab. The Rebbe Rashab is famous for one word. The word is pnimiyot. Pnimiyot means inwardness. I mean, inwardness doesn't only mean that when you do something, you mean it. When you say something, you mean it. Inwardness, the way that Rebbe Rashab translates it, is that you are changed by an experience. It's not like kibolo kachpolto, the way you absorb it is the way that you exude it. It's absorbed and then it's released but that there's an actual change, that something is retained by you and you, you absorb it and it changes you. And after the experience is over, you still, you still remember it's still part of you. Warren Buffett is uh, famous for his success in reviving many, many companies that everyone thought wouldn't make it. And uh, people pay millions of dollars to just to talk to this guy. I think that someone paid $4 million just to have a little lunch with him one time, get advice from him. And he says that his method of business is very simple. When there's a company that everyone's talking about, everyone's speaking about this company in the mikveh, everyone's talking about this company in shul, everyone's talking about this, this company, he runs away from it, he sells it. If there's a company, everyone says, oh, nebuch. It's a, there's, a tr there's a train wreck over there. This company is lost. Oh, then he pays attention. Because if this potential in this company, investing it now and holding on to it until they see some profit in it will bear far, far more profit than the other, other company. That's, that's his general system. In a similar way, there is a teaching from the Friedrich Rebbe about how it's specifically at the moments of our life when we're the most challenged that we're able to reveal inner strength that we're not able to reveal at any other time. It's those times in our life when we feel like we're being broken, that actually our heart opens up in a way that a crack opens up in our heart that, that will never be closed. And it makes us depend on and connect to and to feel Hashem. It makes us have that pneumia, that inner bond with God. Davin Melech was King David was once uh, asked by a prophet named God. He asked him, what would you like? How would you like to be punished? The scenario was, David Abel did something that in his level was not considered to be a mitzvah. And David HaMelech was asked by God, what would you like to do? There's three options. Option number one is to be attacked by a neighboring country and to lose in battle. Option number two was hunger. Option number three was there to be an illness. So David Amalek responded that he wants an illness. He wants a malgefa. He wants there to be an epidemic. Why? David Amalek said, let us fall into the hands of God. Falling into the hands of God means that, as it says in, in the parsha in Mitzrayim, that... Yad Hashem, the hand of God was on the Egyptian cattle. The hand of God means the, um, the, the pestilence, the plague that beset the, the Egyptian cattle. So Davin chose this because when that, that kind of scenario makes you completely reliant on God. When there is a hunger, so there's other options where you will eat, where you won't eat. And when there is war, there's also different ways of looking at the war and thinking about who may help, where you should run away to. But when there is a plague, there's only one address of to stop that plague. There's only one possible way to escape that. And that is to, uh, and that is Hashem. So this is something that we're, long after this will be forgotten, long after Mashiach will come, Long after that we're over this whole uh, this whole scenario, we're going to come out of this, and we're going to feel in a similar way 
to the way the hippies felt. You know, we have to throw aside the establishment and throw aside the gods of our parents and discover things for ourselves. What this does for us is it gives us a whole different appreciation for what life is about. There is the Jewish people, a human being rests on three pillars, on Torah, on prayer, and on kindness. Which of these is the hardest pillar? Which of these is the hardest one to deal with? So Torah, you, um, you feel that when you study Torah that you're gaining because it's, it's after all, you're learning something new. When you pray, you don't feel anything. You don't set, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. The prayer itself doesn't seem to connect with anything that you're familiar with. Prayer is a wondrous thing. There's no parallel for prayer in any other scenario, in any other setting. Prayer is something that's exclusive only to God. Kindness, you do kindness, you know what kindness is. You feel good, you help somebody. But prayer doesn't have any parallel in any other setting. Think about a parent who won't give his child anything unless the child prays to the parent, unless the child begs, you're my father, my mother, you are the most wonderful, kind mother and, and the most brilliant father in the whole world. Please, can I have dinner? That's not what happens. Parents just serve the children dinner. You are the best mayor in the entire world. Can you please let the buses run again? That's how it works. Between a king and a people, between a, a governor and between a, 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 in any other setting, there's no concept of prayer. Prayer is exclusive only between us and God. And the question is, why is it so important? Three times a day, every single day, we have to do this thing called prayer. Why can God just, God just give, us, give us without the prayer? What, what's the point of it? So the Sefer Ikram says that's the reason why people have such a hard time with prayer. They have such a hard time with it because they don't feel that it has any relevance to them. They, they don't have anything to contrast it with to say that it's meaningful because, they, because it, there is no other setting that we have, that we that we pray, only pray to God. And we don't have any other similar experience than anything else. And therefore, and therefore we can't point to it as something that's that's meaningful. We don't understand, St. Vikram says, we don't understand the benefit of doing it. But that's only when the rug hasn't been pulled out from underneath you. But when the rug's pulled out from underneath you, and you feel like you need God, so then all of a sudden prayer becomes very meaningful. Maimonides says that the biblical obligation of prayer is once a day, talk to God. Once a day, you should speak to God. Nachmanides says less. He says, you don't have to pray to God every day. Let's pray to God when you're in trouble. And the Torah says, you should pray to God when people are bothering you, when nations are attacking you, then you pray to God. But we have a mitzvah to pray to God three times a day, every single day. And why? What's the point of this? The answer is, it's not about God. It's about us. The purpose of prayer is for us to connect to God. It's for us to become vessels and to absorb what is really going on in the world. Everything that happens is only because of God's hand. Prayer is an exercise that allows us to connect to the truth of what's really going on. Prayer is a moment where you stop uh, feeling that you're in control and you let go and you put your hands in, you put yourself in God's hands. They say a story about this atheist who was hitch, who was hiking in the in the mountains and he slips and he falls and he's falling down this mountain. He grabs a branch and for the first time in his life, he turns up, is anybody up there that can help? And a voice comes down from heaven. The voice says, yeah, I can help. Oh, you could help. That's fantastic. Wow, there is someone out there. Okay, what do I need to do? The first thing you need to do is let go of the branch. Anybody else up there that can help? We don't want to let go of the branch. We, we, we feel certain independence and we trust certain things. We expect certain things. People throughout their life, they make by health insurance and life insurance, and they want to not have any spontaneous surprises. They want to know what's going on. So this idea of having total dependence on, 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 on God and, and not knowing what the next thing that's going to happen is, is something which is really, something that's really forces us 
to connect to the truth and to, and to and ex- leaves us exposed to the reality that we aren't in control. This is something which is a real gift. This is what ha- we mean when we say the blessings before, uh, after eating something or drinking something, we, we say to God, blessed are you, God, Lord, our, blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has created people and their deficiencies. We specifically thank God for deficiencies. Why thank God for a deficiency? And the answer is it's our deficiencies that crack in our heart, that we need God that opens us up, opens a window in our heart that connects us to, to Hashem in, in a real way, in a very tangible way that we won't forget. There's a story of the Rebbe, which I heard from Rabbi Shneer Ashkenazi. You heard it from the story, the one who the story happened to. There was a Jew whose name was Rabbi um, Motel Rottenberg. Mordechai Rottenberg. He was a Ger Chassid, a Chassid of the Rebbe's of Ger. And he was living in Crown Heights. And although he wasn't a Chabad Chassid, but he would pray in the local synagogue, living across the street from the Chabad Synagogue, 770 Stone Park, where he would pray in 770. And he got, he befriended the Hasidim there, and he would come often to the Rebbe's Fabringans. But one Fabringan, a man goes to the Rebbe by the Fabringan, and he tells the Rebbe that his name is Rebbe Matal Lipsker. Matal Lipsker goes to the Rebbe, and he tells the Rebbe that there's a friend of his who has lots of loans he cannot pay, he needs a bracha to get out of all of his debts. So Rebbe usually would not speak in a way that people could hear, especially something so private. It was a private thing that came up in the middle of the Rebbe's talk that would cover his microphone so no one else could hear. But here the Rebbe responded very loudly and strongly. And the Rebbe said that he has what he needs to live and he's borrowing too much in a way that he cannot pay back. He needs to just live with what he has and not take loans. And then he will get directly from God. That's what the Rebbe said. Matal Rottenberg listened to how powerfully the Rebbe said not take loans. And he thought this was was a personal message for himself. And he decided then and there, he vowed never ever in his life to take a loan. That's what he decided. And he and his family lived with what they had for years. He moved to Bnei Brak, to Israel. And he and his family grew up and uh, raised many children. And uh, no one understood why he did this, but this was his way. His fourth child's wedding, day of the wedding, he was really in a bind. He didn't have money. He was trying to arrange the people from Nebrak should go in a bus from Nebrak to the wedding hall. He didn't have money to give to the bus company, Rothman's bus company, to, uh, to bring the bus. It was the day of the wedding, and he really was out. He and his son, the Chassan, went to the Bab of Rishtibel, the Shtibel, the synagogue of the Bab of Chassidim. And he and his son are there, and as a custom is, everyone in there, their wedding, they wear these beautiful spadaks, these beautiful hats. Litzman's spadaks, best spadaks come from Litzman. They're there, and they're Litzman's spadaks, and, and as they're there, and his father, you know, is, is just talking to God and very nervous about this wedding that he doesn't have the money to pay for. And is, he has to pay people that day. A man comes over to him, I mean, Moshe Yuroslavsky, and he says to him, are you guys making a wedding? He says, yes. He says, okay. There's an envelope of cash in my house. My wife is waiting for you. Please go there. What? He, uh, he doesn't know Ramesh Yaroslavsky. Ramesh Yaroslavsky doesn't know him. He said, what are you talking about? He says, listen, I was just in the Rebbe's room two days ago. I just flew from, from, from New York to Israel. I was in the Rebbe's room two nights ago. And the Rebbe said, going back to Eretz Yisrael, probably there are people that are making a wedding. And if you see, and you should give them, give, and he pulled out from his desk an envelope full of hundreds. To give this to them to help them with the wedding. Probably there's someone making a wedding. You should give this to them. That night, think about how Mordechai Rottenberg danced at that wedding of his son. He didn't just dance because he had the, the aggravation satisfied. He didn't just dance because he didn't have to worry anymore about the wedding. His dancing at a whole new meeting. His dancing was dancing with Hashem. And as Rebbe Shemtev said, when he dances, he dances with God. 
and a Jew dances, who are you dancing with? You're dancing with God. I shared this story last week. Amazing story, just briefly to share it again. When Shalmar Tcherebashkin was in prison, so he wanted to celebrate Shmini Atzeres with other inmates and dance with the Torah. And the problem was, is that they told everyone they have to go back to their cells. So Shalmar Tcherebashkin remembered the Baal Shem Tov says when a Jew dances, he dances with God. So what he did was he went to this Italian roommate of his and he said to him, do you know what the Jews are doing tonight? No, what are the Jews doing tonight? The Jews tonight know what they're doing? And he starts telling them, we go everywhere, there's their, their finery, their finest clothing. And they go out into this room with a huge room and the closet's in the front with the scrolls. And they sing, ay, ay, ay. And he starts describing to him every single detail of, of how what happens in the synagogue on Hakafis. And then he pretends to take out the Torah. And then the one guy takes the Torah and he goes, Anna Hashem, Mashiach, and he has to do the whole Akafis in this little tiny, 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 tiny cell. And he said it was the best Akafis of his life. Why was it the best Akafis of his life? Because when a Jew dances, he dances with Hashem. Without the props, the props aren't there. What, what you're forced to do is, Ptimi, you're forced to connect with who you are yourself and discover what's going on inside. That's the meaning of the name of this week's Torah portion. There was a game. People playing the game were the Alter Rebbe and his grandson, the Tzemach Tzedek. The game is, where is grandfather? That was the game. The Tzemach Tzedek reaches for grandfather's nose and he says, this is grandfather. The Alter Rebbe says, no, that's grandfather's nose. So the Tzemach Tzedek grabs grandfather's ear and says, that's grandfather. He says, no, that's grandfather's ear. So he grabs his beard and says, this is grandfather. He says, no, that's grandfather's beard. It's not grandfather. So the boy leaves. The Alt Rebbe seems to have won the game, and he went back to his studies. And Tzemach Tzedek called out to his grandfather from a corner of the room, and he said, Zayde! And the Alt Rebbe responded, and he said, What? And the Tzemach Tzedek said, That's grandfather. The name of this week's Torah portion is Vayikra, and he called. It doesn't say who called. Why doesn't it say who called? Because every name of God expresses something about God's greatness. But then there is God himself, God's very core. God himself is beyond all of his names. There is grandfather himself. There is God himself, beyond the names of God. So God himself calls out to Moses. And Moses doesn't just, doesn't just mean the person Moses. Every one of us has a spark of Moses in him. So the idea of God calling out to us means that from God's very heart, so to speak, from God's very core, he calls out to us and he says your name. He says, Ronnie. Hi, Ronnie. He says, Beryl. He Pedram. He says, Yenison. God, God calls out to us. What happens when God calls out to us? What happens? When God calls you, what's the theme of this whole entire book of, of Leviticus, of Yikra? It's about sacrifices. What do sacrifices mean? That a Jew says to God, I'm yours, and I want to serve you, and I want to be there for you. That's the theme of the book of Yikra. God always calls us every moment. God's always calling our name. And the response of the Jew to God is, I'm here, I'm yours. That's, that's what Vikra is. Our prayers, it seems, are all very selfish prayers. We ask God, give us this, give us that, give us this, give us that. It's all about us. But the Talmud says our prayers take the place of the sacrifices, which tells us that our prayers aren't only about serving ourselves and we should get different things from God. On the contrary. Our prayers are we're asking God to help us do what he wants us to do. Our prayers are us turning to God and saying, God, help us do what you want us to do. As the Alter Rebbe said, that God gives the Jewish people an abundance of physical blessings, and material blessings. And the Jewish people create out of all material blessings, spiritual blessings. So God calls us from his very core. He turns to each of us and he asks us in response that we should answer him. How do we answer him? We answer them also from, from our very core that, that we're yours. There are different kinds of prayers. There's a prayer that goes, there's a response in heaven, and there's a decision, and there's, so to speak, a bureaucracy. How things get transferred from one world to the next world. And then there are prayers that cause an immediate response, that there's an immediate connection, there's an immediate transfer of energy from the highest of heavens to this world immediately. And what kind of prayers are those? Those are the prayers when a Jew turns to God from his very core and he says, I'm yours, God, and I want and I want what you want. 
I want to fulfill your mission in this world, and I want, therefore, to have what you need, what I need to fulfill this mission. It's a different kind of prayer. It's not about, it's not about the person. It's about, it's about sacrifice, about what God wants. So this is the theme of the time that we're in right now. The time we're in right now is a time when God calls to each of us, and there's no props, there's no external things out there. There's not a synagogue. There's, there's no synagogues. There's no places of prayer. There's no rituals in public. It's everyone's there by themselves, and God is calling our name. And what He wants us to do when He calls our name is to do the same, to recall the name of other people in our life. You know, there's a big difference. You're sitting with your spouse. You're sitting with, sitting with a friend. You're sitting with your child, and you call your child's name. It's a big difference. You'll notice it's a huge difference when your child says, looks up barely up from their cell phone or their Kindle, and they say, what? Or the child looks you in the eye, your friend looks you in the eye, and he says, yes. It's a huge difference. That's what's happening now. God is calling all of us by name. All the, all the different external props are not there, and God is calling each of us by name, and he's saying, it's time. Time for redemption is here. Yankel, what's going on? Shmero, what's going on? Beryl, what's going on? And the response has to be, we're here, we want Mashiach, and we're ready. Time is enough, trouble's enough. Uh, let Hashem bless all of us. There should be a good chodesh, a good month for each of us. And all those who need a refuah shlema, government shishana, and all those need a refuah shlema, should see a refuah shlema, because of mamish, Yisrael, every one of them, and God should answer our prayers immediately. The coming of Mashiach, it's way, way too much suffering in this world. And you can see the good news right away. Amen. All right, I'm going to uh, those who are in the, on the Fabrengen uh, roll call. We're going to start now the Fabrengen on the other uh, chat. Let me end this uh, conversation. Hey, Ezra. Uh, that's not Ezra. That's, that's Jonathan. We're starting the Fabrengen on the chat. Okay.